show, folks. My first guest tonight is an Emmy and Grammy award-winning comedian you know from my life on the D-list and her 23 comedy specials. Please welcome to The Late Show, Kathy Griffin. Thanks for being here. I'm back! That's right. Uh, I, I can't believe we've never met before. We've never met before. It's yeah. ironic. I'm such a fan. Oh, and thank you very much. I think we both enjoy making fun of the administration from yes. time and, to time. And, and many other things. Many other things. Oh, if you're from Oak Park, Illinois. That's quali right. Quality people. Yeah, Midwestern Frank, common sense. As Frank Lloyd Wright country. That's right. Yeah. He was like, anyone who lived in a Wright house in my neighborhood was a celebrity. Right. Yeah, and his house was there too. How about Sullivan and Sullivan? I, this oh, is sure. like an architectural show. We're doing yeah. a lot of architectural yeah. work. This is all on HGTV. <laughs> CBS won't run this part. <laughs> well, uh, uh, in May 2017, my life changed forever. It did. You took a controversial photo. Did I? And you, you, you experienced huge uh, backlash. Oh, I've yes. never experienced backlash for anything. So what was? <laughs> Tell me what that was like to have people not like something you did. Well, uh, not like is a little bit of an understatement. Okay. So, uh, 60 million Americans thought that I was a member of ISIS. <laughs> oh, yes, because they're recruiting a lot of 58-year-old red-haired female comedians. Um, wait, wait, where, where do you get that stat? 60, 60 I, I, I get it from the news. I got it from Sarah Palin. No, I... I... <laughs> There was a poll, like, what percentage of Americans There really think he... was, yes. And I didn't know, like, wh by the way, what, like, what job do you think people thought I had? Like, do you think they thought I was the CFO of ISIS or what, like, the shopkeeper? HR. The... HR. 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 <laughs> HR. Okay. I would have been busy. Sorry. I would have been busy. Yeah, exactly. So that was really crazy. So, yes, I took a photo that changed my life irrevocably. And that was one thing, because the walls caved in on me and the accidental president, um, it's an accident. <laughs> um, he tweeted at me that, you know, my, uh, you know, he tweeted against me, which made everything uh, cancel in my life, basically. I was in the middle of a 50-city tour, and within 12 hours, I had not one single day of work ahead of me. And by the way, to this day, I do not have one single day of paid work ahead of me. So I've been digging myself out of this rabbit hole for the last year and a half, mm -hmm. and the next day, I got a call from one of my attorneys that the Department of Justice, and a lot of people don't know this part, actually two federal agencies, the Secret Service and the AUSA, the Assistant U.S. Attorney's Office, were putting me under a two-month federal investigation and considering charging me with the crime, this is real, of a um, conspiracy to assassinate the President of the United States. Wow. So a lot of people thought, you know, like I got a call from the Secret Service or I got in like fake Hollywood trouble, but no, this is real live trouble. No, no, and... that's real live trouble. When the feds, when the feds show up, that's, yes. that's, uh, that's real trouble. That's right. And so what did you think was going to happen, though? Because... Like, I thought this picture walk... was going to be in like, you know, like stars not normal. Like, I really did, in, like, the Star magazine or but, something. Walk me through it. How did it actually come about? Well, I was doing a bunch of wacky pictures. Yeah. And I had done some prior to that. Like, I did one where I did, was spoofing my then-neighbor, Kim Kardashian, which, by the way, just as a comedian, to be living next door to Kim and Kanye during this whole thing <laughs> got me through. Like, that alone got me through. Mm -hmm. you know something I mean? normal in your something life. Something normal. People that I can relate something to. Something grounding. Yes. Yes. That's right. Sure. And I would just open a window and see Kim and the Yeezys and <laughs> just feel better, feel more American. Yep. So I was on the, um, a lot of people don't know this also, I was on the no-fly list for two months. What? Like I was a terrorist. How yes. did you find out? Did you go to the airport? I was and told. No, I was told. You can't fly. For two months. So um, then they wanted me to go downtown to uh, the uh, precinct in the police precinct, and they wanted to get video of what's called a perp walk. And this was coming, I assume, directly from uh, the Oval Office and Jeff Sessions. Could be. And, I mean, that's where your tax dollars went, everybody. Uh, investigating Kathy Griffin for conspiracy. Just a, I know, but it was real. So um, that specter living under that was very frightening. And mm -hmm. the death threats were very immediate. Yeah. And, of course, I got fired. Everybody knows that, you know, CNN turned on me and mm -hmm. Anderson Cooper said I was disgusting and I lost about 75% of my friends that never came back. And it was hard. So I, um, you know, just started writing again. And I thought, this is a lemon. I got to make lemon. 
lemonade. And um, I couldn't get any you know, work in my country of origin. So I started an overseas tour called the Kathy Griffin Laugh Your Head Off Tour. Get it? Thank you. Where did you go, though? I went to. <laughs> Where'd you go? I went to, I started out in Auckland and I sold out the Sydney Opera House and I went all over Australia and I sold out the London Palladium and I played all over Europe and the Nordic countries and I ended up in Reykjavik. I'm the darling of Reykjavik, Iceland, after Bjork. <laughs> Bjork is first mm -hmm. and then me. And then I finally played Canada because of course they were like, well, we get it. <laughs> they get it. They get it. Mm -hmm. But still, in the United States, you can't get a gig. Uh, correct. And also, when I was overseas, I was also put on what's called the Interpol list. So I was detained at every single airport that I went to. And I played, I ended up playing 18 countries. And uh, I mean, it sounds kind of funny, but like when you're nah. in, right? I know. Well, thank you for saying that. Because a lot of people funny. are like, get over it, honey. It's really scary to be at the airport in Singapore. And they take my passport, they take my phone, and then they put you in like a detention room for an undetermined amount of time. And they never tell you why. And I was too scared to say, like, what did I do? But I was thinking, you know, I have a show at 8 o'clock, and I've got some Gaysians waiting for me to make them laugh, so let's wrap it up. And, you know, I tried to keep my sense of humor, and I ended up building the show. And the show ended up um, being three hours, because I just kept, like, things were added to it, like crazy stuff would happen. And um, when I came back to the States, I still, I was determined to change my whole business model, because Hollywood didn't know what to do with me. So. Um, I hired a marketing company in D.C. called Cambridge Analytica. I'm kidding. I did not. I did not. They're very good, though. I hear very good things. Very good. Very specific. Very, good very things. specific. Very good things. But I did. I hired and I started my first mailing list. I know, old timey. My first text list, and that's really what sold out the tour. And then I was so like blacklisted in Hollywood, which I kind of still am, that I um, started promoting my own shows. So um, I had everyone in Hollywood saying, "You can't sell any tickets." And I sold out Carnegie Hall in less than 24 hours. And thank you. Thank you. I've never sold out Carnegie Hall. Wow. I've sold it out five times. Anyway, um, so, so then I decided to promote my own shows. And I actually wired money to Radio City. And I, just like as an FU, I played Radio City the night before Carnegie. And I promoted it myself. And I've learned that part of the business, which I really love doing. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to make a special, because I've done 23. But this one has a little more meat on the bone. And at the moment, no TV or streaming services are interested. But I am now thinking, what if it's a concert film? And I'm trying to get into film festivals and maybe do a panel with like the ACLU or First Amendment attorney, because I don't want this to happen to any of you guys. None of you should have to go through this mm -hmm. and hundreds of thousands of dollars of legal bills, or God forbid, one of your kids would have put that picture up online. Mm -hmm. So I do believe it was, you know, uh, abuse of power. And we all know it was very covered by the First Amendment, even if you didn't like the picture. Right. So I'm just scratching my, my way back. There are limits to though, what you can say about the president of the United States having specifically to do with harm against the yes, president of the United States. Yes, which I States. did not do. Right. Yeah. Well, you are holding up a, a severed head. No, they, no, it was a mask. It was a ma Halloween mask with ketchup. I, I don't know it wasn't actually the president's head. But I where would I get a severed head? It looks like a severed head. A it has, it has blood on the neck. But the, a lot of the MAGA people think I really went to the White House unnoticed, cut his head off, went back to my house in Bel Air, took the picture with Kim and Kanye not even minding, and then... <laughs> And then went back to the White House and sewed it back on. It doesn't even make sense. And I'm not I, a surgeon. I'm not a surgeon. I never said I was. But would you do it again? How about that? Would you do it again? Um, you know what? I, that's a tough question. I don't know if I would I do that. I ask tough questions. That's what the show is. Welcome, Welcome to Welcome to the real line. world. <laughs> exactly. No, what, what, would, you, would you do it again? Uh, I, I don't know if I would do that particular thing again, but let me tell you, I'm on a mission to make sure that this never, ever happens again. And I was actually at the White House Correspondents' Dinner when they tried to take down Michelle Wolf, who did a fantastic monologue, and I started an online campaign. And as you know, you know, that photo that I took, it was also pre-Me Too, pre-Weinstein, so yeah. I think it may have been a different landscape at the time. But I was kind of the test case, and I'm sure you're well Wait, aware. How, that, how, how are those related to pre-Weinstein and Me Too? 
because I think if you think about how people started thinking differently about what men can get away with and abuse of power and powerful men and how they can lord it over female. Uh -huh. And remember, they didn't charge any of the guys. Like Snoop Dogg allegedly made a threat. Johnny Depp allegedly made a threat. Nothing happened to them. Mm -hmm. So I, like I said, I wasn't, I didn't just get a phone call. I had to deal with a full investigation. And you know, that charge, conspiracy to assassinate the president comes with a lifetime sentence. So it's very frightening to think that I did an under oath and Interrogation where my lawyer said, you know, you basically screw this up and you leave in cuffs. So that's not how it's supposed to be in this country. I mean, the First Amendment is our commodity. It's how we make our living. No, I understand. And it's worth fighting for. And then the president tried to do it to Sam B. Remember when he tweeted against Samantha B, who does a political satirical show? So I started an online campaign. <laughs> and once again, I was like, not on my watch. So I'm on a comedy mission. When's the last time the president uh, talks smack about you? Has it been a while? Uh, no. Oh, Eddie Munster comes after me, Don Jr. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. That one. Yeah. Real stable genius. Yeah, I, I, I'm a little, my heart, feelings are a little hurt because he won't ever say my name. He just calls me the guy on CBS. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait till the feds come. And Maybe. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> oh, well, and. Well, you said, listen, you said that Donald Trump broke me. You don't seem broken. Oh, I was broken for like two days. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't realize I could get unbroken so quickly. And yet I realized I have to, I have this big lemon and I decided to make lemonade. And so that's when I got the idea for the tour. And obviously I was going to deal with the photo in the tour because everybody around the world knows the crazy red haired lady from the picture. And I'm truly global now. So uh, the tour and then filming the special, which I funded myself mm -hmm. because I'm now a very much of a more of a self made woman than I've ever been. And my whole career has been like, I've never really gotten in the front door. So figuring out how to, Get in the side window or the side door. So go back to basics, doing it again. Why does that make you laugh? Well, uh, I just like I like uh, people who are indefatigable. Don't be using your college words on me. I didn't even go to college. <laughs> I was doing commercials undefeated, when I was seventeen. Undefeated people. Okay, undefeated I like people. People. You um, but you you have. I understand that you have an announcement to make. You've been doing something uh, kind of interesting, and that you're you're going to announce to the people. Tonight. I'm very I'm very proud of this. Okay, so I think about how like guys have a lot of ownership in our industry and licensing, etc. So I have quietly spent the last couple of years buying back my own entire library. So starting tonight, I'm not going to like make a bunch of money, but I just want to do it as a statement to encourage gay folks and women and younger folks and that this old bird didn't go down. So starting tonight, you can get My Life on the D-List, all my 23 specials, my talk show on iTunes, and I bought it all back. So I now own everything I've ever done. So it's not owned by like some dude or some old white dinosaur anymore. Beatles don't even own their catalog. <laughs> Well, Kathy, so nice to meet you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Stephen. The complete library of Kathy Griffin's work is available now on iTunes. Kathy Griffin, everybody. We'll be right back.